Yeah, augmented reality lets you put media out into the world, move the internet out into the world, and allow anybody with a smartphone access to the information they need when and where they are. We have this opportunity to democratize the production and consumption of information that's relevant to the world around us. Augmented reality can really transform the way people think about information. The question really is how to create these experiences such that they're both compelling and useful and potentially address real actual human needs. Whether it's a mundane or practical application like overlaying maintenance instructions on a piece of equipment or medical information on a patient, uh, or something maybe a little bit more complex like taking situational awareness information and presenting it to a soldier or to a first responder or to a policeman. Our Argon project is about making it possible to create augmented reality experiences just using standard web technologies. The real key is that anybody who knows how to build interactive web technologies, so build a website for a mobile phone, build a website for a desktop, could really create a mobile augmented reality experience. I just dream of this world where I can be wearing my head-worn display and it'll look like a pair of sunglasses. I look down at my car and I see maintenance instructions on it. I'm trying to cook in the kitchen and somehow I can get the recipe just sort of floating next to me in space. What makes people nervous is the idea that the technology would also allow us to categorize and reduce everything around us to information, right, and, and take away the realness of the world. If you look at the history of the web, the history of film, any of the media that we're used to, we didn't really understand what they were good for until lots of creative professionals who had vision, who had ideas, could start experimenting with it. They couldn't have predicted Flickr and Twitter and Amazon and YouTube and all these sites. And so I think the same is going to be true of augmented reality. Until we get it out there, we won't really know what the technology is good for. Hi, my name is Keiichi Matsuda. I'm a designer and filmmaker. This is my studio in Hackney Wick in East London. When I was studying my masters at the Bartlett School, I started to think about how we could introduce virtual worlds into physical spaces. And that's when I found out about augmented reality. So I produced a series of concept films uh, called Augmented Hyperreality that speculated on how our environments could be adapted and digitally enhanced by having this ever-present overlay on the city. One of the defining characteristics of augmented reality is that it's subjective, i.e. like everybody can see their own version of the city. And it means that everything is customizable. So if you imagine the city as a series of layers or a series of feeds, you'd be able to subscribe to just the ones that you like. So the city itself becomes a reflection of your tastes and interests. Since the time I started developing those original films, I've always wanted to extend those ideas and continue the research. And now I've just started a self-initiated project that I've backed on Kickstarter called Hyper Reality, which is a series of three films, each from the perspective of a different person, set in Medellin, Colombia. We're never actually going to see the faces of these characters, it's all shot point of view, but what I'm thinking is that you'll be able to understand a lot about the character just by looking at those environments. For Dazina Mini Frontiers, I'm going to take a scene in one of the upcoming Hyper Reality films and explore what it's like to be driving through the augmented city. So the film's going to look at both the kind of in-car functionality, like what the dashboard of the future might look like, but I think the main focus is going to be on what's happening outside the car, the kind of transport infrastructure. The type of future that I'm imagining is a future where augmented reality is everywhere. It's a part of everything. We don't even consider it as a technology anymore. And it means that uh, a lot of the things that we take for granted uh, in everyday life, uh, like when we're navigating on the streets, that the road markings, the signage, all of that can be applied in the digital layer. And if we consider that, it means that the way traffic systems work could become much more dynamic and much more free-flowing. So you just have sort of open spaces and you drive according to where the markings tell you to go. The problem of the actual interface is something that I get asked about a lot. You know, how does this technology actually work? You know, what is the, the hardware apparatus that we need to see it? I'm aware of some projects happening right at the moment which are sort of set to kind of revolutionize this kind of process is not like Google Glass putting on, but it's something much, much bigger and much deeper. 
with an overlay you're always going to be limited so people are now looking into like contact lenses for example which apparently are doing pretty well and the other big thing I think is is about kind of projecting directly onto your retina so it uses kind of system of little mini projectors that, that kind of point directly in. So, uh, what you see here? First of all, who are you? I am Supun Samarasekara. I'm a technical director from the Princeton office in SRI, uh, in the vision and robotics activity there. So, in my activity, we do a lot of work in augmented reality, specifically for the military. Yeah. So, I'm going to show you some of the technology we've developed there that we think is going to become more and more prevalent in the commercial world also. And so, these are augmented reality binoculars. That is right. So, I, I have Google Glass on, which does not do augmented reality. A lot of people think Google Glass actually that is, does. That is correct. You can do some form of it in very simple ways, but if you want an immersive experience, it doesn't really do that yet. We are hoping it will get there. Uh, so, uh, what it is, is we've taken a military binocular system yeah. and taken the guts out, we printed the shell and put our own uh, equipment in there. So this, this is, is 3D printed. It's really this, cool. is, this is 3D printed. Yeah. Right? So just to give you some motivation of what we want to do with it. So in the military world we are using it for military training but I thought I'll motivate it from some of the commercial applications. So one is for things like tourism. Right? Yeah. If you walk around there are so much geotagged information out in the world what you want to do is to pick up your binox, look around, and start seeing geotags. Okay. Right? So basically you can mark up interesting sites to see. Now this, this is interesting. Can I tag, if I looked at the Transamerica building, could I tag it through the binocular? And then if other people were using the same binocular, would they see that tag? Yes. Oh, I can understand why the military would be interested in us. Okay. So, and the second part is information sharing, as you were just saying. Yeah. So you can mark up a spot, leave a message behind, not just mark up a point, but actually yeah. leave a message for a specific person. And when the person looks at it, uh, you will be able to see the can, message. Can these tags be put on movable things, by the way, like trucks or people? Or? Um, not not right now. So, okay. I mean, the technology, we are just introducing geotags over what is seen. Yeah. Fundamentally, if you have a way of tracking the person, it can be inserted as things that you see. And in the military world, we do that for airplanes and stuff. I'll show you a demo yeah. of that, quick video of that very shortly. So, will there be a mobile app that goes with this so that I can tell Sco send this to Scoble? So uh, that is right. The hope would be eventually we have this other VPA technology. You'll just speak to the binox and say, look, send this to so and so. And it will tag the message and send it. Right? So no keyboard, nothing hands free. And the, the goal in the future is to have it be able to tag moving objects. So that's right. When you're all in the whale watching boat and somebody knows that that's a gray <laughs> whale mother with a calf. Well, for everybody you can see where the military would be. They've already disclosed that they can uh, put a drone up above us, 17,000 feet above us, and watch 17 square miles with moving video down to a resolution of six inches. That's up on YouTube. So that's public information. <laughs> And so you can imagine when, when you have that overhead view, then you need somebody on the ground to tra tag all the uh, right. things that are on the ground. That's right. Know? And whatever you're tracking could be tagged and followed on the ground. And I'll show you something similar that we do. So a second area is now what we would like to do is to actually publish an interface where others can plug in their own thing, whether it's a tracker, as you were saying, yeah. or for you know recreational sports you know if you someone comes up with a bird watching or bird detector you could plug it in now you can move around your binox and suddenly it'll go bing 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 i found a bird and it'll guide you to find the bird right 
No. And it'll probably tell you all sorts of things about that bird. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Now, yes, it's using is something like Google, Go Google Goggles, not Google Glasses, <laughs> but the image search engine, uh, cloud-based search engine, you can Google, easily... Exactly. So you hope is that you plug it into the cloud and that will do the processing and feed back the information. Now, yesterday, someone was Rex, just... where I work, we love the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love people like you who are going to bring more imagery and more uh, databases into the world. <laughs> now, yesterday, someone was suggesting a very cool idea in this Boston... Um, marathon situation kind of yeah. thing. They say, can you plug in a people detector that has a list of people of interest and can someone be just looking around and get say, okay, go look at this person more. Right? So he, it's an interesting thing and yeah. you know, if you have a framework like this, you should be able to plug in stuff yeah, like that. Face detection is clearly coming. Right. Facebook already bought face.com, right. which is an Israeli company, yeah. and it worked pretty good. And, and the key thing is you need the resolution yeah. to detect the face, right? So with the binocs, I mean, a lot of the time, if you look at the webcams that are up on the roofs of buildings, it cannot do the job, right? So if you have something like this, it can potentially actually work. Yep. So here's a military application that they use it, uh, use the system for. And this is for what they call the forward observers. These are the guys who are out in the battlefield who mark up targets uh, for, you know, purposes yeah. you can all imagine. Uh, so what you see on the left here is the kicked up version of your Google glasses, which is true augmented reality glasses a person is wearing and he can see the helicopter flying. This is a virtual helicopter, and through the binocs, it's sharing the view that is showing the zoomed-in view half a mile away of a vehicle it's attacking, right? So there are multi -people, multiple people watching this. This is the Google Glass, future Google Glass view, I would say, yeah. and that is the binoc view, and they are training on how to call for fire. So this is one of the applications we are using uh, this for. So are you saying this is a future competitor to Google Glass? I actually think Google Glass will want this technology yeah. <laughs> more than well, I, uh, yeah. you, know, you know, this is where it will go. How yeah. soon till something like this can fit into something like Google Glass? I think it's not far. I mean, if you look at most of the mobile processing platforms, you know, you get 4-core, 8-core mobile processors coming uh, right now. Yeah. I think it's a, a matter of time. The sensing is there. Uh, the cloud is there. And all these things are coming together to really make this a viable system. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a couple of it's, slides. It's, you know, it's really interesting seeing wearing the Google Glass product. Um, yeah. It's very clear that Google had to make some trade-offs for weight, for battery life, and for cost. That's right. They're that's right. clearly aiming to set a $200, $300 price point. That's right. Um, if, if not at retail at first, they might yeah. charge $500 or you know, so, so at first, but the cost of this is going to be under $200 that's to build, right. and that's yeah. really interesting. This stuff would raise the cost or raise the battery that's or raise right. the weight, yes. and that's, that's going to be further out. But I think it, when you get to commercial quantities, all these become... You know, more viable. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so that's the key point. What's the image resolution of the sensors that are in, um, in the area? So right now, a lot of the stuff we use is uh, limited to twelve eight to twelve eighty ten twenty four, and it's mainly because the iPhone display resolutions and displays that you can go on these things. But that is also technology that's evolving very fast. Yeah. So that, that's a lot sharper than the resolution of my Google Glass. That's right. I, I believe the screen resolution is 320 by 240, right, which right. looks pretty sharp, but it's not really good for yeah. photos or for live video. That is right. Stuff. That is right. So all those. So, have to so you have two of these displays here. Yes. The displays are they 4K displays or no? This is very basic. Uh, uh, VGA resolution displays. We okay. have higher resolution displays. I didn't bring one of those systems here. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is what you see here is a Vuzix <laughs> glass. How much does this cost you to build today? I mean, uh, it's all custom built. But. Yeah, I mean, the parts I would say is about between ten to fifteen thousand dollars worth of parts. And the right time now. invested. Yeah. Um, so, whole <clears throat> augmented reality, we have over $20 million worth of workflow that we've invested in it. So, I mean, what you're seeing here is not 
through one program. It's over many, yeah. many programs. Uh, but this one we've been doing for about a year right now, what I'm going to show you. So what would we see if we looked through this? So the first application, and it's the same image that you're going to see here. Yeah. What I did is before you came, I set this up. I marked a few things with messages okay. for you, you guys. You can see it's uh, live. <laughs> right? Right. So. And, and the key idea here is, let me move this to someplace else. See this line? Yeah. It tells you how to get to the message, right? Yeah. So if you pick this up and follow the line, you can see where the hello Robert message I put there would come up. Wow. Uh, you're welcome to try it, otherwise I, I can do it for you. <laughs> and can I see? Oh, yeah, yeah, I let, can actually let, see the let, image. Yeah, let, let me pick it up. You can actually pick it up, hold it in your hands and do it. All right, uh, let me, uh, <laughs> I'm live, so. Right, so now follow the line. Yeah, see, like, uh, when the line becomes short, you are at the message. Yep. Right? Now, wow. I also created a message for you, Shell. So, <laughs> I can... It's always wrong. It's wrong. Sure. <laughs> so you can see, if, if you were over, let's say, uh, over that way with another pair, you, you, could, I would be able to see that message. It, the message is, is aligned in 3D. In 3D. Right? So, so if I was over across the so courtyard... Follow the line till the line becomes short. So go in the direction of the line. Go left. Yeah. I, oh, that line there. Oh, there. I see. Okay. Yeah. Shell, welcome to SRI. Oh, you went a little too far. <laughs> well, I, I read it before it disappeared. <laughs> That's on right. It's, it's still there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I forgot you're all seeing what I'm saying. Yep. Yeah, so right. you can see how bad I am with military level binoculars. <laughs> the other point is you want to talk about how the technology is independent of this one pose. How is uh, basically yeah. reconstructing the three D photogrammetry of all the all the information. So so when you tag that building yes. and you put a message on it for me, yes. that that tag is exists in a three-dimensional three. space. So exactly. we would see that space even if we walked across. Exactly. So, so they are, these are all getting geotagged. Now what is very interesting is that is geotagged and we are very precisely geolocating the binoculars. So when you're, I could take this to the roof up there, you'd see the same tags. But not only that, if you put 3D objects, you'll see them in the correct perspective from that point. Right? So the next demo I'm going to show you is actually putting some characters down. Right? Now, if he went up to that roof, the, if the guy was looking that way, he'd see face first, I would see the side here. So it's actually putting 3D entities, truly 3D geolocated in the 3D world. Wow. Right? So, so this wow. is, so like what you see here, this is a real back-end game engine that's yeah. running here, and it's working in the real world. So think of the next generation games you're playing in the real world. Yeah, but Google is already playing with 3D walk-around games called Ingress, mm -hmm. and it's pretty interesting that you yeah. have to walk. It puts virtual objects on the world, and you have to walk into the virtual objects to play with them. That's and right. And that's, that's pretty, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. pretty interesting. Yep. Um, so, so you could see a whole bunch of commercial applications, but it's going to be... <laughs> you know, five to 15 years before we get this, right. this kind of technology in our glasses. That is correct. So this is a, but you know, for us, everywhere we see a video camera, we want to augment it, right? Yeah. So if you're wearing one in our head, we want to augment it. If it's in the Binox, we want to augment it. We should if do it's a vehicle, we want to augment it. We should talk about it. So you want it in the iPhone too. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So, so any the, smartphone. Yeah, any, any, anything that has a camera, that's where we want to take it. And that's all right. You that you clip on, you it, want that to be on. HD TV was invented here, and so yeah. were some of the things like the uh, lines on football fields that during TV. Correct. That is Cause, correct. Because, uh, uh, right, that, you guys yeah, bought right. Sarnoff that, or that, Sarnoff? That, that, uh, that came out of our lab. Certainly <laughs> HDTV was done by uh, the Princeton group yeah. at SRI. And also what was originally the group that did the lines on the football fields, that was called PEB, Princeton Electronic Bulletin Boards, and that came out of Sarnoff, which is now part of SRI as well. Very cool. So you guys have a, you, you're not kidding when you say uh, you'd love to augment every video camera. <laughs> 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 
We see video, we see augmentation. How will that change the world? When all the cameras are augmented. See, the thing is, we are really getting to a point, there's so much information, and there's information overload, and geo-specific access to information is a key thing we believe is useful, you know? Yeah. You, you really want information just in time, just in place, right? So, so that is what the augmented reality can provide for you. So, I, so one of the things I want to do with the Google Glass, and it doesn't do it yet, is just say, hey, show me the closest Taco Bell or show me right, show right. me the closest Starbucks. Yeah. Using this technology, somebody could sit up and just yeah. tag a lot of things really, really quickly. That's right. Now, Google already has a, a, like a Starbucks yeah. tag, but yeah. this would be very, very useful yeah. for that kind of stuff. Just to Shell's question for a second, the, um, if we had the ability to use augmented reality for all cameras, that could be an organizing principle for all the information in the world. As Supin just said, it, yeah. the information is there, it's contextually located in space for you, which is, people think about space a lot. We act differently in our kitchen than we do in the office, right? So you want different information represented in different ways in different places, and that's the kind of thing that this technology can give you. Wow. It's really uh, pretty crazy. I, I don't know if you saw the Israeli company that helped uh, the FBI look through thousands of photos and videos of the Boston bombing, but it compressed all of those images so that they could scan and compare movements of people mm -hmm. in real time. It was really pretty amazing technology that, that I was reading about this morning. Um, you add that with this, and you're going to be able to see the world in a completely oh, yeah. different way in 10, yeah. 5, 10, 15, 20 years, right? Right. And again, not, not just what's there, but what you can put there for the purposes of helping people understand things better or just organize their world. Yeah. I, you know, I, I said the Google Glass is really a shift for Google from an advertising-based world to a commerce-based world. Because when I walk in, we're going to go to a San Francisco Giants game with the Google Glass. The PR team invited us over there to talk about how sports would change with walkable, you know, wearable computers. Because Google's not the only one doing these kinds right. of wearable computers. <laughs> But you're going to be able to look around the stadium and see where the bathrooms are or right. where the hot dog stand is or where right. your friends are in the stadium. I can already do that with the Oakley glasses. Right? So just one more thing if you, if you want a wild idea. So the, if you go back in history, like 500 years, um, human memory was something that was super important. And when you went to university, they would teach you how to memorize things. And one of the ways they would do that is spatially. So they had this concept of a memory palace where you'd imagine yourself walking through rooms and the things that you were visualizing just in your imagination would help you remember things. Yeah. So now we're going to be able to do that in augmented reality. It will be an augmentation of human memory and cognition. Pretty interesting stuff. We're going to put our task list on that building. <laughs> no, it's not a joke. I know it's not a joke because I, I'm actually going to apply, like, if I need to pick up a, a power outlet, I need to pick that up at the hardware store, right? right? So I'm going to put it on the hardware store, and that way when I walk within 100 yards of the hardware store, up comes my task list. Absolutely. And the, the list doesn't have to be text. It can be exactly that item that you need to pick up. Okay. Okay. So you got the characters up on the yeah, so, yeah, yeah, while you were chatting there, so, so this... Oh, this, you mean a character like a human? Yeah, uh, right. So you put a fake human, yeah, a virtual so, human. Yeah, so right? now here I don't have the game engine, otherwise they could be running around too. So if you look, uh, there are oh some special God. VIPs here. You gotta see this. So who's oh in a Humvee, God. and there's a, you know, guy, guy at the entrance there, and I believe... There should be another guy around here somewhere. Hanging out in the trees. Who's guarding that car? Get him, Rocky! <laughs> <laughs> now, the key thing about the technology we do is also see, I can shake this, and it's shaking along. You know, yeah. it's, it's. My it's, camera's shaking it's, too. But yeah, okay, okay. but, but uh, it's, it's like rock solid wow. with the ground, right? And to do this at one kilometer, two kilometers away, is not an easy thing to do, so that is one of the key technologies. How much code did you guys have to write to do that? <laughs> There's a lot of... <laughs> Can you give me a hint of what the algorithms are doing to keep that image so steady? So, yeah, so we track features, 
But what is interesting here is we track features on a wide field as well as a narrow field and we combine it with the inertial sensors like IMU, GPS, and we combine all of that to get to that rock solid uh, wow. uh, stability. So, so and this probably partly came out of the work you guys did with the football lines, right? That it's all a continuum in a sense. Because you know? the, the early yeah. football lines, they had to put markers on the field, and now that thing works without any marker right. on the field, right? Now the key thing between the football field and the stuff you see here and what we do on the helmet systems is even what they do today on the football field, the cameras, doesn't move a lot. It's very much at some fixed locations they're panning around. Here you want f f to total freedom in moving around, right? So you should be wow. able to walk out of the building, come into the building, go to your grocery store, and it should keep track. And this is all tied with cloud computing because if Rocky is across the street using his goggles, that's right. He's going to see that guy from his point of view. Exactly, right? exactly. Wow. So, so we could really play new <laughs> kinds of games. Absolutely. Paintball is dead. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be able to have virtual shootouts in the street, and people yeah, are like, yeah. "What are you guys doing? Oh, we're out of the game." <laughs> you, you can play a virtual uh, paintball in your home without messing it up. <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> well, it's really all right. <laughs> that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty mind blowing. So, we're pretty close to that with the Google Glass. I mean, I, battery is a problem because keeping it on, yeah. uh, my battery only gets an hour and a half, but I, right. I'm carrying a Mophie pack in my, po in my pocket, which yeah. extends the battery by <laughs> seven hours or so. So, that's really cool. Yeah, so, so that, I mean, a lot of tech challenges like battery, communication, bandwidth, all these things, you know, but all these are things that will get addressed you know, going forward, so. Well, thank you so much. Um, no on SRI, where do, where do we follow your work? Uh, so, we are in the Princeton. What would I search Google for? Uh, if you search Vision Technologies uh, under SRI, you will find the activity in our group. Uh, probably my name will show up in a lot of the references, yeah. too. Uh, Great. <laughs> so fun. Uh, thank you so much. No this problem. is really awesome. and. Uh, I, I hope it escapes the military soon so we can use it, we can use it for shooting each other in the street. <laughs> Rocky's like, no, I'm not going to shoot you. You know you're going to, when you get Google Glasses, you want to put one in my head. Come on, man. <laughs> Thank you so much. No problem. Who are you? So my name's Jay Wright. I am Vice President of Business Development at Qualcomm. And, and, and we're talking about augmented reality. And, and where are we today? <laughs> where are we? I think we're probably what I would describe as the second phase of augmented reality for mobile devices. I would characterize... But, no, but what's the physical space oh, we're I'm in? <laughs> we're in the Qualcomm Museum today in our headquarters building at our main campus in San Diego. It's really cool, and uh, one of the first cell phones is behind me, and it's big. <laughs> it is big. They all start out big and end up smaller, faster, and cheaper. And you're taking advantage of that trend, right? In augmented, so we're gonna talk about augmented reality and, sure. and where the world's going with these glasses and wearable computing, and uh, well, tell me where the world is going, because uh, you guys build the chipsets inside almost every uh, mobile phone out there, right? We do. We do. We provide chipsets for quite a number of models of phones and tablets and other types of devices too. A but bunch I think, of which are out here. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a bunch of examples that that we'll show you today. But I think where the the world's going, at least as where as as far as phones are considered, is more toward this context awareness concept that I know you've been following a lot. Yeah. And we've got that this vision at Qualcomm of a digital sixth sense where we're able to do sensing all the time and increasingly all the time so we can take different information and find out what you're doing and help filter information that you're receiving. And so to people when they hear that, first of all, they might be freaked out. I call right. it the freaky line. Yeah. What do you mean you're tracking me all the time? And you, what, Well, tell me what you're able to track right now on a, on a mobile phone if it's in my pocket. 
Just tell me so what kinds of location. sensors. So location is something that can be tracked. Certain gestures can certainly be tracked by sensors that are there. And then with the camera, we can actually recognize certain things in the environment. And that's what Vuforia and our augmented reality platform are all about. Yeah. And where is it going in the future? Because I, I was just at, at Oakley, and they yeah. talked about having cameras on goggles yeah. that could both look forward and capture what you're experiencing, like skiing a run, but also look at your eye and track your eye where you're looking so you can build new kinds of user interfaces, right? Absolutely. And it's probably that class of device or that class of glasses that at some point will displace this phone or primary device that we carry around in our pocket. A large number of those same experiences could probably be reproduced in glasses if we had that eye tracking capability and the ability to recognize everything in our environment. Wow. And, and can't so, have our hands free. And so you've been working on the uh, recognizing things in our environment. What's that technology called? Computer vision, generically. But the software platform that we've built for developers is called Vuforia. And Vuforia is all about making devices and apps see. So we're essentially turning the camera on your phone into a digital eye. Do you have any examples of that? I do. We've got a ton of examples. Let's, let's walk around and sure. uh, you can show me a few. Sure. So we're seeing applications, and today, Robert, we've got over 2,000 applications that have been done by third-party developers. So That's already today. This is not in the future. This, this is, is not in the future. You don't, need, is, you don't need the iPad 7 or anything like that, right? You do not. We're going to be showing these on commercial devices, and these are commercial applications, although I do have some R&D demos that are here, too. Okay. So the bulk of the applications that we're seeing are marketers, and they are using computer vision and augmented reality to create engagement with their advertising and with their products. Yeah. So, and, and that's a big deal. Oakley is uh, thinking about how to use these technologies in retail stores. That's right. Because, uh, you know, Luxor Luxottica, who owns Oakley, uh, has Sunglass Hut, has yeah. all these retail channels uh, uh, to sell eyewear and stuff like that. And so they build, they're building in their labs right now these interactive retail experiences where you walk in with your cell phone yes. and you can do things, right? Yes. So what can you do? Yes. So I'll show you an example. I okay. actually have a retail example after this. This is going to, one of the examples that's been done for the publishing industry. Okay. So what we're seeing now is a large number of applications that are companion applications for print publications. So this happens to be one that works with Maxim Magazine. Yep. So there's an application called Maxim Motion. And if you have Maxim Motion, it will work on certain pages of Maxim Magazine. Okay. So you'll see here, for example, as I point the device at this magazine, this image on the cover will actually come to life. And they've done this video in a pretty creative way, so it looks like she's actually jumping off the page. Okay. So as you look here, you can see almost seamlessly it was recognized, and now there's a video that's being played directly on top of the page. And so this will continue. This experience can happen throughout the magazine. And then depending on the publisher or what the advertiser wants to do, there can be some kind of call to action directly inside the magazine. There can be a purchase capability directly inside the magazine, but it's giving the publisher a new way to turn physical print into an interactive medium. Now, technically, what happened there? It, it turned the image, the pixels of yeah. the image, and what did it do in the computer? What, yeah. what happened? So what happened is we initially recognized this image. So this application ahead of time has a database of the images it knows how to recognize. That database can live on the device, and if you've got a million or more images or a huge database that you can't manage on the device, you can also put it on the cloud. So what we're doing is processing every camera frame that comes off that camera sensor. We're comparing it to images that we have in the database or the cloud. If we find a match, then we're loading the content, or the app developer is loading the content that should be associated with it. And then Vuforia tracks that image 30 times a second to see where it is in the camera frame so the graphics can be drawn in the appropriate place. And that's what really creates that realistic effect as if the content is really in the real world. No, that's really cool. All right. What else can you do with this stuff? So let's go ahead and show another an educational example here. And I am going to switch devices. Apparently this is not on this device. All right. Over here. So this is a children's book, and like many children's books, it has activities inside of it. And this one is called Rocks in My 
rocks in my socks. Yep. And it's about teaching kids to deal with adversity. You know, sometimes things are a little tough. I've got rocks in my socks, and I've just got to learn how to deal with it. So as I cruise through, you'll see there's some, some exercises. So, for example, this one is a dinosaur kind of matching game. And you'll see now when I put my device on top, I'm going to get a completely different experience on top of the book that allows me to play a different matching game. Wow. So we can see here all our different dinosaurs are hanging out. And I'm actually a little embarrassed to admit that this isn't um, that easy and I will make mistakes on here. But I'm going to go ahead and try Stegosaurus. Try again. Okay, let's try him. Stegosaurus. Ooh, nice job. Yep. So you get the idea. I'll go ahead and quit while I'm ahead. Now there's going to be a whole new range of toys. There's a company called Toy Talk, a startup, that just got $16 million of funding. Yes started by the former CTO of Pixar, and he's gonna use this vision on actual physical toys. So you're gonna hold your Thomas the Tank Engine in front of a camera on the iPad, and it's gonna say, hey, you know, welcome, and, and I think we probably, nice, nice Thomas the ta Tank Engine toy, right? You absolutely will. So toys have this physical play experience, and now there'll be another digital play experience on top of them, which is great for a toy manufacturer because it's extending the life of the toy, but there's also a new revenue opportunity because now that toy manufacturer can sell digital content inside the app that works with the physical toy. Now, th this technology works great when, you, when a developer has actually put this page in the database and taken a picture of it, and, and w what happens to that image in the database? What, you know... Tell me about how it's processed. Is I assume that's being processed and it cut, is. It is. cut up into pieces so it yeah. knows what it's so like. Yeah. That, that database does not contain all the bits from the original JPEG. What's actually stored in the database is a munged version of that JPEG that you can think of as an image signature. But it's ba basically a collection of what we call feature points, which are small little areas in the I image that have a high variance in contrast. And it's the number and distribution of those feature points that forms that signature. So what happens when we're actually doing the matching and looking around is each frame, we're looking at the image using that same algorithm to extract the feature points, create a signature of what we're looking at, and compare it to the signatures in the database. Now, I assume that in your database there's only a, hundred, a few hundred thousand or maybe a few million images. That's not enough for you to walk down the street and get a hit on everything you're looking at, right? Right. I assume that someday we're going to be in a world where you will get a hit on literally everything you're looking at. Right. How do you get to that world? Because is, is this technology scalable enough to deal with uh, a world like that, where you fingerprint everything in the world? I think so. I think so. And Qualcomm's working on this technology. Other folks that are in the search business are also looking at this technology and shown large numbers of images can be searched and visually identified. But what we're trying to do is work with developers that have one particular brand or application that they're trying to set, associate with a fixed set of products or pages or even products that might show up in the store. Yeah, because this is going to take, to build a company that actually recognizes everything in the world, right. you'll need to build a lot of data center space or, or you know, take a lot of space on a uh, rack space cloud, which is expensive. You need a lot of rack space. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. <laughs> but you brought up a good point, and yeah. it's one we're talking about, about the user experience. And you, you can create an application today and try and make it recognize everything in the world. But that's sort of the boil the ocean approach. Yeah. And the reality is I can't recognize enough things really for it to be compelling for a user to continually use. So what we're trying to do is enable application developers that work with a fixed set of objects that will work very reliably so we know there will be a good experience and the developer and brand knows there's going to be a good experience with it. Yeah. Well, I, I assume uh, the guy who started Keyhole, uh, which now is Google Earth, yeah. uh, he said by 2020 we're going to have perfect vision. He thinks that by 2020 we're actually going to see this move out of the domain-specific instances to the world where we're just going to walk down the street with our glasses and it, it's going to hit on a lot of things, both because of our GPS but also because of the camera on the, on the glasses. I absolutely believe that. I think all these things will converge, all these databases that today are in a single app will be unified in some fashion and the right experience will happen when I see the right thing. And hopefully we're able to filter that in such a way that people aren't overwhelmed by things they're not interested in. Yeah. But I'd like to show you a demo on the toy front. Now, okay. This is actually one from the labs. We've shown it a couple times before, but you mentioned the ability to augment physical toys. And what we're going to show you is actually state-of-the-art for 3D object recognition. 
and it's something we worked on with the Sesame Workshop. Okay. And as you probably know, Sesame is very big on using new technology to help children learn. And what we've done is adopted a, a toy set concept, and with this toy set, there's actually different mats, and these mats are envisioned to be different rooms in the house. So in this case, I think this is Bert and Ernie's bathroom floor, this is their living room. And then these figurines are different things that I might find in a play set. Now they happen to be a little psychedelic looking so that we yep. can make some of the computer vision work. But I'm going to go ahead and show you what this looks like now when we add the tablet. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the Sesame application. Okay. And again, this is, this is a prototype, but it's going to show you exactly what's possible with toys. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure I've got the flash on. So the first thing that you're going to notice is now when I'm looking through the tablet, I don't just see the floor, but I see walls. Yep. And we're actually in Bert and Ernie's living room. And I actually know that because if I go really close, I'll see Bert and Ernie on the wall. But the magic happens when I take the physical toy and put it inside the play environment. So let's go ahead and put Ernie inside. Sesame Street friend in here with me. So what just happened there is we recognized a 3D object. We took graphics and a model of Ernie, the same one that was used for this 3D print of the toy, yep. to create animation that fully envelops the physical toy. Yep. And the effect here is that Ernie has come to life. Yep. And this was really exciting to see kids react to. So now Ernie has said, hey, why don't you put Bird in there? And what we're doing is encouraging the child to explore. So I'm going to go ahead and try and do this. So we'll go ahead and now Bert's been introduced into the scene. Bert's a little skinnier. Yep. So he gets hard to recognize sometimes. Oh look, it's Bert! Hiya Bert! Oh hi Ernie, it's great to see you! Nice room! <laughs> Put something in the room that Bert and I can watch! Go ahead! And then we can take the concept further, so I'm going to go ahead and put the TV in the room. TV. I hope it gets the Pigeon Channel. And you'll see we're actually playing a video on top of the TV. Yep. So this wouldn't have to be a child oh, holding the tablet necessarily the whole time and trying to steady. Wonderful this could be something that could be sitting seen. down in a rack. But it shows you the type of experience that's possible, right? Yep. The actual physical toys coming to life and creating a new and more beneficial learning experience on top of them. And then technology-wise, this is also first of its kind. What's happening here is we're recognizing 3D objects from any angle, and we're doing more than one at a time. Right? Yep. So most of the demos you'll see when you see AR technology will be maybe one or two things, but these are multiple objects all happening simultaneously. And this is actually on a dual-core Snapdragon S3 um, yep. processor. And Disney owns the patent to pass electrical signals through the paint on top of the tablet itself. Cool. Seen that the Cars uh, app? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I interviewed the guy who invented that in Sweden, and uh, it's pretty ingenious the way he figured out that you can pass electricity through paint, through conductive paint, onto the tablet surface where there's a, a sensor. It's really cool. Yet another sensor in our Another laptop. one. It's got to be good to be a kid today. I yeah. wish I, actually, one of the surprising things and kind of funny stories is, you know, the first time we saw that work, that, oh my gosh, toys are coming alive. How amazing is that? But when you tell a three-year-old, hey, hold this thing up and the toy's going to come alive, look al alive, of course it will. Like, there's no magic or wonder. It's just the expectation, right? Things just do that. Yep. Really funny. Yep. So you mentioned retail. And retail is a big opportunity for augmented reality. Um, one of the things we can do is create a better shopping experience in the store. So, as we probably know and have experienced, shopping online for things is a little bit better than in the store. Many times I can see all the colors that something comes in, all the sizes. What well, you have infinite inventory. Amazon proved this to us, right? That, that they could sell many, many more books and give us much deeper choice than even a biggest Barnes & Noble store that we could walk into. Right? That's right. So we worked with American Apparel on this demo right here. And the idea was they wanted to create an experience inside the store that was comparable to what you had online. I want to be able to find all the sizes, all the colors, and get comments and reviews from products while I'm shopping in the store. 
So what I've done right here is mock up a very simple environment, as you might see in American Apparel. You'll see some clothes that are laying around, and then you would also see here these little shelf tags that go next to them. Yep. And so what we can do now is point our device, and I've run this American Apparel application. We can point our device at the tag, and we'll see here we're using the cloud now. So this database is stored in the cloud. And as it scans that image, you'll see the image actually jumped out of the camera view and became part of the user interface for my application. So you'll see here also the price is now visible on the app, whereas the price was not visible there yep. because it doesn't make sense to print prices there that change all the time. And then I also have the ability to see all the colors that this comes in. I have the ability to look at reviews very simply and easily. Coming soon, by the way, uh, there's some startups that you step into a, a booth with yeah. Xbox Connect sensors. Yes. They can scan your body to plus or minus uh, a quarter inch. Yes. And they can put that clothes on your body. Yeah. Uh, the virtual dressing room applications, as we call them, love those. Yeah. I need to get that in my living room because then I can officially never go to the mall. But you can actually do it with one Connect sensor, which is now $100, right? So it's coming coming soon and That's we great. were at Autodesk last week and they showed us that you can scan somebody's uh, face uh, it, very exactly and actually make a virtual model of somebody it's really crazy really cool. exciting stuff the retail world is about to change a lot uh, Oakley showed me some concepts that are uh, com confidential right now but the interactivity in the retail world is going to be pretty crazy yeah, so what else you got? I think it will. I've got another educational example that I'd like to show. And this one that was actually done for the College of Education in the University of Illinois. And they put this application together for the School of Nursing. Yeah. And what they were trying to address is a shortage of cadavers. There's not enough cadavers for people to use to learn about the body. So this target is meant to be the surface where the cadaver would be, or the virtual cadaver in this case. Yep. We've got a smaller version and the actual version where students would be using this. This would be printed out full size, so that would be head to toe. But what you'll see here is when we point, when we point down, we get a very accurate model of the human body. So these guys spent a lot of time, as you can tell, with the 3D graphics. Wow. to get this really, really good. And I can turn off different layers, if you will. So the muscular system, skeletal system, I can turn on and off. I can make skin appear so I can see actual skin on the body. But what's neat here and what augmented reality is bringing to the experience is this notion of physical scale. Because I'm looking at something and I'm moving along and I get the sense of where I am on the body and then the ability to look at it from any angle. If you watch the right TED video, you can actually 3D print a lot of the body now, too. <laughs> so we're going to have virtual uh, cadavers where you can actually have a physical one staying there pretty soon. Right. Pretty crazy stuff. That's cool. And it's, yeah, it's so really it's using the same image tracking te technology that the magazine used. It, it just is. is looking at pieces of this yep. image. So everything I've shown you is now a commercial application with the exception of the toy demo, which is still a, a prototype. But we're working with some toy folks on some pretty amazing things for yeah, the future. I, I bet my friend's starting Toy Talk, and it, it, what he's been talking about is pretty mind-blowing. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So what's, not, what's over here? So you got a this little is village actually, here. Uh, this is another R&D demo. And this is useful when I want to create an AR experience that actually responds to objects and elements in my environment. So wouldn't it be fun if I could have little characters that could run across my desk and bounce into my computer when they run into it? Or a child to have an experience in their room where characters run around and jump on and off the bed? That takes a little bit different type of technology. And the name for the technology is called SLAM, and it stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And it actually comes from robotics. Yeah. Robotics needed to do this stuff so robots didn't bump into things. But what it does is it allows us to build in real time, a 3D model of the environment. So you'll see here, as I'm moving the device around, and we're in a diagnostic view here to show you what's going on, but you'll see these yellow and red points appearing. Yep. Those are feature points in the environment that have been identified as common points, and when I get a certain level of confidence in those points, you'll see that we're dynamically creating a 3D mesh represented by those green lines around it.
And you can see we're, we're pushing the processor pretty hard on these uh, oh, yeah. chipsets. We That's are. why you need multi-core and, and faster it's processors. It's why you need right? multi-core, and it's also why you need to really work on these algorithms, these computer vision algorithms for the, from the ground up and redo them for mobile. So that's one of the things that we've really been working hard on. So you'll see here, now I've got Santa sitting in the middle. And if we come down a little bit lower, Robert, and we want to prove that this is 3D, I'm going to make Santa come and jump on the top of that building. Wow. That's and now cool. he'll come jump down and run around. Yeah, so really, really fun. And I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting experiences for kids and others where now we can bring these digital experiences into real world environments. And of course, this is all the same technology we'll need and use in glasses when those are available too. Very cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Where do we track your work? Where, do you have a blog or do you have a place that we can uh, watch what Qualcomm's doing in terms of augmented reality? Yes, absolutely. So the place to go today is our developer website. So that would be developer.qualcomm.com slash euphoria. And we'll actually have a new web presence that'll be launching in the very new future but you'll be able to get links to it from the one I just mentioned. So this, the, the Euphoria is available as an SDK. Is that available on what, Android and iPhone or just Android? Or Android and iOS. Okay. So it's available for both. It's freely available. You can build applications and distribute applications absolutely for free. Uh, the Cloud Reco service, if you want to use databases that are in the cloud, there will be a fee for that. Uh, but there's a certain level of usage that you can use for development in some limited commercial scenarios that's free of charge. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for giving me a little demo. This thank is awesome. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks.